Commissioner, the next witness is Ms Sansom, but I think there's a, a change of AMP's team, so could we just... Well, I think we call the witness and uh, council can reorder themselves. Thank you, Commissioner. I'd leave the papers there, Mr. Leave, Allen, yeah, and you. let others sweep them up for you. That's what thank board you. chairmen do. <laughs> thank you, sir. Sansom, if you'd be good enough to come into the box, we're just sweeping some papers aside. But before you sit down, may I ask whether you'd prefer to be sworn or to make an affirmation? An affirmation, please, Commissioner. Good enough to affirm the witness, please. I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm. I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give will be the truth. Will be the truth, the whole truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, Ms. Sanson. Do sit down. Yes, Mr. Hollow. Thank you. Is your full name Rachel Catherine Sansom? Yes, it is. And is your current business address 33 Alfred Street, Sydney? Yes, it is. Um, is your current position Director of Regulatory Governance? Yes, it is. And in that role, um, do you provide trustee services to AMP Superannuation Limited and NM Superannuation Limited, which are the trustees of AMP's superannuation funds? Yes, I do. And have you received a summons to appear at this round of the of hearings of the Commission? Yes, I have. Do you have the summons with you? I do, yes. I attend to the summons. Exhibit 5.276, the summons to Ms Sansom. Ms. Sansom, uh, have you prepared a witness statement which addresses certain topics and questions specified by the Commission? Yes, I have. And is that statement dated 9 August 2018 and relates to rubric 5-35? Yes, that's correct. Do you have an original of that statement with you? Yes, I do. Are the contents of that statement true and correct? Yes, they are. I tender that statement in the exhibit. Uh, the witness statement of Ms Sansom, 9 August 18, concerning rubric 5-35, exhibit 5.277. Thank you, Mr Commissioner. Yes, Mr Hodge. Thank you, Commissioner. <clears throat> Ms Sansom, your present position is the head of regulatory compliance, is that right? It's the director of regulatory governance. Oh, I'm sorry, the director of regulatory governance. Yes, that's correct. And does regulatory governance, is that the office of the trustee in effect? It includes the office of the trustee, yes. Okay. And were you previously the head of the office of the trustee? Um, my previous job title was the director of trustee services, which was in effect the office of the trustee. In effect, the office of the trustee yes. is trustee services? Yes, that's right. So trustee services sits within regular, is it, I'm sorry, regulatory guidance or regulatory Regulatory compliance? governance. Governance, I apologise. So is what's happened that you've moved up to a more senior position or is it a, effectively a rearrangement or a retitling? Um, some additional functions came in to report to me following a restructure in the group. And when did the restructure of the group happen? It occurred um, in April last year. So until April of last year, trustee services comprised how many employees? Around about 11. About 11? So yeah. that was you and then a staff of 10 that reported to you? Yes, that's correct. And were they all full-time employees? Um, there was a variation. Some people might have been on part-time terms and conditions, so it's maybe four days a week. And so in full term equivalent terms, how many employees were there in the in trustee services until April of I last year? I would estimate that to be nine and a half. And now that you are in relation to regulatory or operating in relation to regulatory governance, have you had extra employees added to the office? Yes, I have. 
And so how many people report to you now? Currently 15. 15. And in terms of the way trustee services goes about performing its duties, has that changed very much over the course of the last five years? Um, no, not to my knowledge. And there has been a change in the directors of the trustees over that period of time? Yes, that's correct. Does what was trustee services and is now regulatory governance, does that deal with something other than providing support or assistance to NM Super and AMP Super? Yes, there's an additional function in the team which um, looks after the Group Investment Committee and the Group Investment Committee looks after additional entities. It also um, looks after the investment components for the super trustees, but also some other entities in the group. And how many of the employees are devoted to the Group Investment Committee? Um, we do operate a fairly flexible structure, so depending on the peaks and flows of work, we may have almost everybody focused on trustee services at one time, and then we may have um, four of the people in the team periodically just focused on the Group Investment Committee. It would depend on the timings and preparations of, for either trustee board meetings or Group Investment Committee meetings. And the Group Investment Committee itself, yes, is that comprised of people from what is now regulatory governance and was trustee services? So the Group Investment Committee is a management committee of AMP and it comprises senior executives from across the group and has a non-executive chairman. And who is the current non-executive chairman? It's Trevor Matthews. And so he's external to AMP? He's a non-executive director of the AMP Limited Board as well, um, but has this as a separate responsibility. And I does ask any you, Ms. Sansom, just to try to keep your voice up a little, you have a naturally uh, quiet voice. If you could uh, speak a little louder, it'll help me. Um, sorry, Commissioner, I've moved the microphone a little bit closer. Is that a bit easier? Well, yes, the people in front of me will uh, uh, work out what that's doing to the recording. Uh, <laughs> Now, does anybody from trustee services or regulatory governance sit on the committee? No, they don't. Okay. It provides support services to the committee? Yes, it does. And there are people from other parts of the group that actually sit on the committee and make the relevant decisions? That's correct. And those decisions would include things like how particular matters in relation to how investments are to be made? Yes. That may, that may be too imprecise. There's, in terms of, say, the structure of AMP Super, AMP Super invests its assets through investment-backed or investment-linked life insurance policies with AMP Life? That's correct. Some of the superannuation money and other superannuation money is invested through platforms and doesn't go through a life-backed superannuation policy. Now that's for NM Super, isn't it, rather than a AMP part Super? part of NM Super, but for AMP Superannuation Limited, it's all through Life Backed. Yes. Yes. All of the funds of which AMP Super is the trustee are invested through the Life Back Insurance, Life Backed Insurance policies. That's correct. Yes. And part of the assets of the funds of which NM Super is the trustee are invested in that same way. Yes, that's correct. And part of the funds are invested through platforms. Yes, that's correct. And NMMT operates those platforms? It does. And when it comes to the investments made by AMP Life of the funds invested with it through life-backed insurance policies, those funds are managed by AMP Capital? Um, not all of them, no. So it may be that through various vehicles, that the actual day-to-day -day management of the assets is done by other investment managers as well, but AMP Capital oversees the whole piece and yeah. may or may not be one of the managers. I understand. There's an, there's an agreement in place between AMP Life and AMP Capital pursuant to which AMP Capital will oversee all of the investment of those assets that have come 
from AMP Super to AMP Life? Yes, that's correct. And then AMP Capital will determine of those assets which investment manager is going to manage those assets? Yes, it will put decisions around that through to the Group Investment Committee. And some of those investment managers might in fact be AMP Capital and some of them might be other investment managers? That's right, yes. And the decisions that AMP, or when AMP Capital wishes to make a decision about those types of things, does it then have to come back to the Group Investment Committee to see seek the Group Investment Committee's endorsement? Yes, it does. But I should say that I don't personally run the day-to-day -day management of the Group Investment Committee, although I do attend the committee as an observer. You're just making the point that the, I think, that to be, you can't say exactly how it is that the Group Investment Committee operates on a day-to-day -day basis. No, I can't. You, when it has formal meetings, you attend those meetings as an observer? I do, yes. Okay. And you were the head of, or director of trustee services since what date? Um, since late October 2015. Okay. And before late October 2015, did you hold a position in relation to trustee services? No, I did not. Okay. So I want to ask you some questions about my super and yes. the my super transition plan that AMP used. I'm assuming you've probably reviewed documents in relation to this in the course of preparing to give evidence. I have, yes. And I assume also that in your role as director of trustee services, you would have had to from time to time review documents about the My Super Transition Plan? Yes, that's correct. Do you know, or are you able to tell the Commissioner, what part of AMP Group determined the transition plan? So a specific project was set up to um, manage the Stronger Super implementation, and the decision making for the transition plans, as I understand it from reviewing the paperwork, sat with the trustee board. The decision making for reviewing the transition plan. Is so that the right? transition plans were drafted and put together by a special purpose project team, and those proposals were, as I've understood it from the material I've reviewed, brought to the trustee board for their endorsement. And the board endorsed the plan that was brought to them? Yes, that's correct. And then that plan was followed and implemented. And Related to the transition plan was the initial pricing of the My Super products? Yes, I believe so. And are you aware that that was also something that was brought to the board, the boards of the trustees to approve? Yes, I believe it was. And so that we can see this in some context, can we bring up AMP.6000.0226.0015? So this is we understand it, the memo that was provided to the boards of, AM, of AMP Super and NM Super in relation to the My Super fees that were going to be charged? Yes, that appears to be the document. And <coughs> do you know, was it the case that the original fee basis was approved by the trustees in 2013? and then not subsequently revisited until a month or so ago in July of 2018. I believe there's been consideration given to pricing as um, various reviews have taken place, but the opportunity to um, endorse a price change hasn't been there until quite recently. I don't think we're disagreeing with each other. The no, first no. time a price change was brought to the board of AMP Super and NM Super in relation to the My Super products was in July of this year? That's correct. And so the boards had approved the original pricing back in 2013, is that right? 
Yes. And if we look here, we see the memo is coming from the project director of FOFA and Stronger Super Program. Yes, that's right. Is that the special program that you were referring to having been set up? Um, yes, I think that was what it was called. But there was also a um, program that was the initials were TOPS, but I can't remember exactly what that stood for. I apologise. That's right. And then the board was asked to approve the fee basis that was being put forward to it in this Yes. Matter. And you can see if you look at the bottom of the page that at the time the board is being asked to approve it, the proposed fees have been discussed by the AFS Product and Insurance Risk Committee. They have not yet been approved. Yes, that's what it says. And do you <coughs> know that the boards of AMP Super and NM Super were being asked to approve the proposed fees, but then ultimately it would then have to go to PERC to approve the fees or to the boards of NMLA and AMP to approve them? Yes, there's various delegations in place within the enterprise um, around formalising approval of various fees. And if we go over the page to dot zero zero one six, we can see these are the fees that were being set out and this is the information being given to the board. Yes, that's correct. And this was a memo that was supposed to be read together with another memo which is, if we bring it up on the other side of the screen, AMP.6000.0225.0812. So this was a 10-page memo concerning the applications for my super product authorisation. Yes. I tender those documents, Commissioner. As one or separate, do you think, Mr <coughs> Hodge? I'll tender them together, Commissioner. Exhibit 5.278 will be Memorandum to Board of AMP Super and NM Super 13 May 13 concerning my super fee basis, AMP 6000-0226-0015. Together with MEMO to Board of AMP Super and NM Super application for my super product authorizations. Uh, MEMO dated 7 May 13, AMP 6000 together exhibit 5.278. Thank you, Commissioner. Now, could you just explain to the Commissioner what PERC is? I understand it to be a pricing committee within the, um, the AMP business. You don't sit or have anything to do with that committee? No, I don't. And interacting with that committee is not the role of the Office of the Trustee or regulatory governance? No, it's not. I want to show you another paper and see whether you've seen this before. Can we bring up AMP.6000? <coughs> dot zero one five three dot zero three six seven. So this is a paper for PERC for a meeting on the twenty ninth of May two thousand and thirteen. Yes. Have you reviewed this document in the course of preparing to give evidence? Um, I've seen the document, but I unfortunately haven't the opportunity to um, consider it in depth. Is it a document that you'd seen before you came to give evidence? No, not to my knowledge. Is it the type of document that you would typically see within the office of the trustee? No, it's not. Commissioner, is, could I suggest, is that a convenient time and it might be convenient if Ms Sans Sansom is provided with a copy of the document over lunch, which might speed up some of the questions after lunch. Yes, can that be arranged, Mr Hollow, please? Yes, we certainly can. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Come back at 
2 p.m. Thank you. 2 p.m. <laughs> Yes, Mr. Hodge. Thank you, Commissioner. Now, Ms. Sanson, just before the break, we were looking at this document, which is AMP.6000.0153.0367. Yes, we were. And did you get the chance to have a look at that over lunch? I have read through it over lunch, but I should note that it is a technical paper prepared by an actuary. Sorry, the... Yes, I just wouldn't profess to be an expert on this paper from having read it, read it over a lunch break. I understand. It's not the type of paper that would typically be provided to the trustee. No, it isn't. Thank you. And I just want to draw your attention to some parts of it. So I think when you're referring to it being prepared by an actuary. Do you mean the entire paper has been prepared by some actuarial part of AMP or do you mean it just contains actuarial information? It, it appears so that the author is an actuary. Okay. And if you have a look on the first page do you see at the bottom of the page it says the timing of when the superannuation funds will automatically transfer members is still to be determined, but it is likely that some members will opt into my super and transfer their own balances prior to that date? Yes. Now, that would suggest, and I appreciate this is before you started with the trustee, that as at May 2013, the transition plan had not been determined. I think initial transition plans had been put in place, but they would continue to be looked at as um, events unfolded. So my understanding is that depending on how each transition went and whether it was successful, that there was possibilities to make adjustments to that if required. I see. There was an initial plan that was put in place at some stage, timetabling out how the transitions would occur? Yes, that's my understanding. And then if there were some issues that arose, then it might be necessary to change the future transitions. Yes, that's my understanding. And that timetable was put in place by some other part of the business away from the trustee? Yes, but that would be typical. So the trustee outsources his activities and a specialist project team would need to be stood up for this time, type of um, very large change program. And. <coughs> Presumably, though, the transition plan is reported back to the trustee? Yes. But reported back in the sense of this is what we are going to do? Yes. And this, in, this paper, which you can see from the bottom right corner, is 46 pages long. Yes. This contains a lot of information about the assessment of the pricing for the MySuper product and also what the effects on margins will be as a consequence of the MySuper pricing? Yes, it does. Is that the type of information that you would typically expect to be provided to the trustee? No, I wouldn't typically expect that to be provided. Okay. And if you go to the page which is dot 0381, it's page 15 of 46. You see, this is a section dealing with commission 3.3. Yes. And <clears throat> do you see there's a sentence, a second sentence in the second paragraph which reads, insurance premiums deducted from my super AUM, is that assets under management? Yes, it is. My super assets under management might include an allowance for commission. Such commission will be retained by AMP and will not be remitted to the financial planner? Yes. Do you know whether or not that's the case, that the insurance premium contains some allowance for commission? I'm not sure if that would still be the case, but it may well be. And if we go then to page .0383, You see section 3.6, which is 
setting out as at the 29th of May 2013 the modelled transfer rates for ADAs? Yes, that's correct. And you see that what's suggested at that time is that for products other than super leader, 5% of the total balances will be transferred by 1 July 2014, 10% by 1 July 2015, 60% by 1 July 2016, and 90% by 1 July 2017? Yes. Do you know how that schedule was arrived at? No, I don't. And then you see for super leader, the schedule is a little different. It's 5% of total balances transferred by 1 July 2014, 10% of total balances by 1 July 2015, 15% of total balances by 1 July 2016, and then 95% of total balances by 1 July 2017. Yes, that's what it says. Which would suggest that 80% <coughs> of the balances of super leader are to be transferred in the last year? Yes, that's correct. And again, do you know why that was the proposed timetable? I can see that this is how that was modelled. I'm not sure if that is consistent with the actual timetable. Are the reasons why the transition plan was timetabled in a particular way something that were communicated back to the trustee? Um, I'm sorry, Mr Hodge, would you mind repeating the question? Yes. I said, uh, were the reasons why the transition timetable was planned in a particular way something that was communicated back to the trustee? Yes, I believe so. So I believe the trustee was um, taken through the various complications to do with the ADA transfers so the plan that was put in place was to, by the project was to do the most simple ones first and then to work through a program of increasing complexity to, to sort of test and learn the process to ensure it was done accurately. It was a very complicated process requiring um, multiple products, multiple system impacts. That's the information that was provided to the trustee? Yes, and also to APRA. And to APRA. And was there any discussion with the trustee about what assessment AMB, AMP had made of the effect on revenue of transferring at particular times? Um, not being in the role at the time, I wouldn't be able to say. Subsequently, though, from when you took up the role in 2015, did anyone talk to the trustee or to you about what the effect on revenue was of transferring a particular time. Not that I recall, no. And if we go to page dot zero three nine one, we see one of the, this is a section dealing with sensitivities. What's explained is at the end, bottom of page 25 of 46, that if 100% of the ADAs were transferred in 2014, the effect would be a reduction in the present value of profits of $86.5 million. I'm not sure where you're reading the 100% in 2014. See, it says just before the table, however, if 100% of ADAs transfer in 2014. Um, am I, I'm wondering if I'm on the incorrect page because I'm not reading that. It's page 25 of 46. Okay. There's Immediately above the blue bar at the base of the page. You see the blue oh, bar yes, going sorry. the line above I was it. looking at the wrong table. However, if 100%, yes. <clears throat> so that, again, you and I can only read what internally AMP wrote down, but internally it had assessed that if 100% of the ADA is transferred in 2014, the effect will be a reduction in the present value of 
in-force profits of $86.5 million. Yes. And is that the type of information that you would expect to be communicated to the trustee? Um, not necessarily. I believe that if this program were to occur today, that based on the board that I currently serve, that they would certainly ask those questions, yes. If we go to page.0395. You see at the bottom of the page, there's a heading distribution impact. Yes. And 6.4.1 deals with commission. Yes. And then 6.4.2 deals with value proposition. Yes. And do you see in the middle of that paragraph, it says PwC have been engaged to build out both an economic model and planner heat maps to identify impacted financial planners? Yes. And if we then go over the page to page.0396, we see the explanation is this modelling will allow AMP to build comprehensive value propositions for the financial planners, employers and members to assist in achieving the following outcomes. And the first item is to minimise impacts on AMP's net cash flow and operating earnings arising from the introduction of my super products. Yes. Now, have you seen the PwC heat maps? Um, I believe I've been shown them in my preparation for today, but I've not seen them prior to that. They weren't something that was provided to the trustee? No. And was the trustee told or informed about the fact of these heat maps, to your knowledge? Um, not to my knowledge, no. And was the trustee informed that an outcome that AMP was seeking to achieve was to minimise the effects on AMP's net cash flow and operating earnings arising from the introduction of my super products? Um, yes, one of the pa matters that this paper doesn't seem to address from my review that appeared to be of primary concern for the trustee board was actually the management of the risks associated to move with moving that amount of money and member accounts. So that appears to be the primary consideration of the trustee board. So while it would be natural for other parts of the business to consider other stakeholders, that from my read is what the trustee board focused on. Not, not from this paper? No, not from this paper, from, but from other material. You're saying there's other material where the trustee is told there's a risk associated with transferring assets over too rapidly. Yes, that's correct. And that's the information that's provided to the trustee? Yes. By other parts of the business? By the program who was running this, the implementation of the ADA transfers. And as far as you can see, the trustee accepted that information on yes, its face? Yes, that is my understanding from the information I've read. And then, if we go over the page to dot zero three nine nine, you see then there's an identification of future developments and it's explained that papers will be submitted to the PERC and or AFS ALCO. What's that? What's ALCO? I think it was is the Asset and Liabilities Committee, I think. I see. And we see the third point is determining the schedule for transfers of ADAs to the appropriate My Super offer. Yes. Attend to that document, Commissioner. Paper for uh, AFS Product and Insurance Risk Committee 29, May 13, My Super uh, Pricing Report. Uh, AMP 6000 Exhibit 5.279. And then we can then bring up AMP.6000.0225.0802. This is the trustees' My Super Transition Plan in relation to the SST? Yes, it is. And it's dated the 3rd of May, 2013? That's correct. 
That's correct, yes. Do you know whether it was updated? I, I think so, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay. And then if we go to page.0806, we see item six, the trustee must by no later than 30 September 2013 mm -hmm. and quarterly thereafter identify all members within each of the trustee's superannuation funds which holds an accrued default amount and the amount of each default contribution. Yes, that's correct. And it doesn't seem as if, but you tell me whether you've noticed anything different in looking at this document, that there's any specific plan explained in the transition plan for when products will move over, I'm sorry, for when ADAs will move over to my super. I think this document is dealing with the steps that need to be undertaken before any amounts can be transferred. I see. At some time, though, the trustee was told what the actual transition plan was that had been determined by some other part of the business? It will have been, yes, and it will have been kept updated of progress against that, those transition dates. I tender that document, Commissioner. Trustees, my super transition plan, 3 May 13, AMP 6000-0225-0802, exhibit 5.280. And then if we can bring up AMP.6000.0233.0051. So this is the PWC AMP My Super heat map analysis. Yes, it is. And as I understood what you were saying before, the first time you saw this document was in the course of preparing to give evidence. Yes, it is. After the commission had notified the solicitors for AMP that this was a document that might be tendered. Yes, that's correct. And is the information that's contained in this document the type of information that you would expect to be provided to the trustee? No, it's not. If we go to page two of the document, this is the executive summary and we can see the bold headline at the top. My super will impact planners and AMP significantly accurately identifying the practices to support or specialise is key to a successful corporate super strategy? Yes, that's correct. And then it explains a few findings and insights, one of which is 10 practices have greater than 60% of their corporate super revenue predicted to be exposed to my super? Yes, that's correct. Do you understand what it means to say that revenue is exposed to my super? I would assume that what PwC is referring to is that um, advisors would have been receiving revenue from the accounts that would then be subject to accrued default transfers. They were receiving revenue while the assets were still part of the accrued default amounts? Yes. Once those amounts were transferred from the ADA product over to the MySuper product, those streams of revenue would stop? That's correct, yes and hence they have revenue that is exposed to my super. That's correct, yes. And do you recall, again, accepting that you only came to the trustee in 2015, any discussion with the trustee about an issue around advisors streams of revenue being exposed to a my super transition? I don't recall having read that in any documents, but the trustees need to focus on the member, not on um, outcomes for advisors. Yes, well, one way they could do that, one would think, is by making sure that the parts of the business designing the transition plan are also focused on outcomes for members rather than benefits for other parts of the business. Do you agree? Yes, I agree. And. It's difficult to do that unless the other parts of the business tell you, that is you, the trustee, what they're up to. Um, they may have spoken to the trustee about it, but I wasn't there and I don't know. All right. And 
if we go through to page.0059, we see what's explained at the top of that slide. 11 practices have greater than $400,000 in corporate super revenues with over 50% of these revenues predicted to be exposed to my super. That's correct. And throughout the rest of this document, it goes through in great detail identifying which advisor groups are exposed or significantly exposed to the transition from ADAs to my super. Yes, I believe it does. And by exposed, what we mean is they will lose the streams of revenue if the books of clients transfer from ADAs over to MySuper. That's my understanding, yes. And then if we go through to page.0081, we see, so this is page 31 of the slide pack we see step two in the development of a planner proposition is dealing with critical issue solutions through heat map value propositions. Yes, that's right. And you see the paragraph, the second paragraph under that step says several of the decisions regarding my super, such as bowler and timing of ADA transition may be informed through leveraging the heat map data and complementing it with further qualitative and quantitative research to test solutions? Yes, that's correct. And do you know whether that occurred, whether the heat map was used to guide the ADA to my super transition process? I have no reason to, to form a view as to whether it was or it wasn't. Obviously, this was analysis being done for a particular stakeholder lens, which is fair for people to do, but my understanding is the overarching reasons for the transition timetable were more one of managing the operational risk of doing the transitions. So I would expect different parts of AMP to do analysis for particular stakeholder groups, but it's still my belief that the overarching reason was managing the risk. Because that's what was said by one part of the business to the trustee? That was the lens taken by the trustee. And if we go to page.0093, we see the headline calculations for revenue. Yes, we do. And you see there's a gross margin basis points summary of each different product based on the size of revenue exposed to my super? Yes, that's correct. And you see the products with the two highest gross margin basis points exposures are flexible lifetime super? Yes. And custom super? That's correct, yes. And do you know which products were transferred last? It would be these two products, which were also the most operationally complex to transition. I see. And so your belief is this information about the effects on revenue was not something that was taken into account in determining the transition plan? I'm sure it was one of the matters taken into account, but I, my understanding is that the operational risk would have usurped this analysis in the trustee's eyes. Usurped, I'm sorry, usurped this analysis in the trustee's eyes? Um, I strongly believe that the trustee's considerations around the complexity of making the transfers is the primary factor that drove their consideration of the transition plan. I think that we need to just be clear about what the decision-making process is. It wasn't the trustee that designed the transition plan? No, but they were the ones, as I understood it, that approved it. Another part of the business designed the transition plan? Yes, that's correct. 
that part of the business came and brought the transition plan to the trustee? Yes, they did. And the transition plan and the trustee, in the way that it seemingly always does, approved what was brought to it by that other part of the business? Yes. And unsurprisingly, perhaps, the trustee, which wasn't told anything about the effects on revenue, didn't say anything about the effects on revenue? I don't know what the discussion would have been at the time. I see. When you were expressing your belief about the lens through which the trustee approached this, what was the basis of that belief? Reading the papers that were given to them and also the minutes from those meetings. I see. And the papers said there's a risk, this is your recollection, the papers said there's some risk in transitioning more quickly than this? Well, certainly when I came into the role and had a briefing by the executive responsible for managing the transition plan at the time, um, the explanation given to me and also seen that given to APRA in the consultation as things have gone along is to do the simplest ones first, to do those successfully, to learn from that and keep moving forward as things became increasingly complex. I do note the observations you're making um, and I agree with the observations you're making but I do believe that that was the case. So you agree with which observations that I'm making? Um, around the higher revenue to financial advisors, also coming from the most complicated products to transition. And do you know why they were the most complicated products to transition? I believe it was the number of different permutations there could be in identifying the accrued default amounts, um, ensuring that you were, because it, what you're actually doing with an accrued default amount and trans positioning it to my super is moving a member's money without their consent. So there was quite a considerable amount of work done to ensure that the members who were being transferred were not being financially disadvantaged by the transfer. So I believe as they went through each product, that analysis became more complicated and there was more of an IT component to it. That is my understanding. I'm not sure I follow that for this reason. They do an analysis with PwC's assistance in May of 2013 where they identify, that is the other part of the AMP business, that the products that have the, will most decrease the revenue going either to AMP or the planners are the custom super and flexible lifetime super products. Do you agree? Yes. And it would seem to follow that those must be the products where the members will most benefit in terms of fees by moving over to the MySuper product. That could be the case, but my understanding is there are additional considerations into whether the financial interests were served. So, you know, insurance arrangements, um, whether the particular member amounts were subject to other matters. I see. And taxation. Um, considerations. This is obviously a piece of analysis that's been done. Um, I can't um, speak more about it because I wasn't involved in it being done. I understand. I tendered that document, Commissioner. <coughs> AMP My Super Heat Map Analyses, uh, 1 May 2013 by PwC, AMP 6000 Exhibit 5.281. And then just to tie this off, can we bring up AMP.6000.0005.5817? So this is the, or a part of the papers for the a meeting of the boards of AMP Life, AMP Life, I'm sorry, AMP Limited, AMP Life Limited, and NMLA. Yes, that's correct. And you wouldn't, as I understand it, attend these meetings. <coughs> no, there's only one for one very brief item once a quarter that I would attend. And if we go to page dot five eight eight seven.
we see the top item on that page, successful ADA transition. During the last weekend in April, we completed our largest ADA transition, which marked the end of the program of work. The transition involved the consolidation of $4.836 billion in default super funds. And then you see a little further along, ADA impacted members across flexible lifetime super, custom super, and residual members from signature super, AMP flexible super, and super leader. And that's consistent with, I think, what you were acknowledging before, which is the residual members of signature super, AMP flexible super, and super leader were transferred in April of 2017, along with what seems to have been the bulk of the flexible lifetime super and custom super members. Yes. I tender that document, Commissioner. Board papers, AMP limited, AMP life, NMLA 22 June 17, <coughs> AMP 6000 005 5817 exhibit 5.282. And then can we then bring up AMP.6000.0061.5936? So this is a memo dated the 27th of April 2016 for the audit committees of AMP Life and NMLA. Yes, that is. Again, these are not committees that you would attend? No, they are not committees I would attend. And this isn't a memo that you had seen at least before preparing to give evidence? That's correct, yes. Have you reviewed it in the course of preparing to give evidence? I have glanced through it. Okay. There was a considerable number of documents, Mr Hodge. Yes. And you see it's concerned with an update on strategic review of BOLA? That's correct, yes. Are you familiar with BOLA? I'm familiar with the term BOLA, yes. You understand the basic idea of it, which is it's an offer made to planners affiliated with AMP, that AMP will be the buyer of last resort? Yes. And if you go to page.5937, this is dealing with transition strategy. Were you aware that a concern within other parts of the AMP business was the effect on BOLA of the transition from ADAs to my super? I can see how it would be a concern, but it's not something I've looked at in any depth. It wasn't something that was mentioned to the trustee? Um, not to my knowledge, no. And you see the third paragraph on that page says the capital impact for practices transitioning to the new valuation approach is forecast to be net neutral at a portfolio level. However, there is a significant proportion of practices that will experience a reduction in their register value by over 5%. This is predominantly due to the reduction in ADA value. Yes, I can see that. And then you see the agreed transition strategy is designed to mitigate this risk by smoothing changes over 2016 and 17. The yes. gradual reduction of ADA values and the introduction of other terms in June 2017 creates a glide path of any practice capital loss that is typically exceeded by practice growth over the same period. Yes. And on its face, that would seem to suggest that the way in which ADA values are being reduced, which is a consequence of the transition plan, is being factored in or being affected by a strategy that has been developed in relation to BOLA. Do you agree? Yes, I don't know what would be the primary, I'm assuming that the timetable would be what's informing the BOLA strategy. All right, I tender that document, Commissioner. Memorandum to AMP Life and MLA Audit Committee 27 April 16, AMP 6000 0061 5936, Exhibit 5.283. Now, I want to then move to a different topic, which is concerned with the setting of performance targets for the MySuper products. We've looked already at a document from May of 2013 where we saw that 
the fee basis for my super was presented to the board of the two trustee companies to be approved then, that is then in May 2013? Yes, that's correct. And then if we then bring up AMP.6000.0128.0515, we see these are the papers for the trustee meeting on the 28th of March 2014. That's correct. And if we go to page dot zero five four one, you see this is a paper for the board explaining investment performance and measures of success for my super funds. Yes, it is. And if we go over the page to page dot zero five four two. See at the top, there's a section which explains what the measure of success is for the My Super products, and it's explained given the Australian regulatory environment, performance versus CPI plus target will be the key measure of success for the My Super life cycle funds and also for the My Super balance. That's correct. And you're aware that for each of the My Super life cycle funds and also for the My Super balanced fund, I'm sorry, I said fund products, there is a particular target that is set, which is CPI plus a certain number of basis points or percentage. That's correct, yes. And that is set not by the trustee, but by somebody else? It is um, set by somebody else and then proposed to the trustee for their approval. I see. I tender that document, Commissioner. Board papers AMP Super and N M Super 28 March 14 AMP 6000 Exhibit 5.284. And then can we bring up AMP.6000.0164.0524? So this is a memo for the AMP Investment Committee dated the 11th of May 2015. Are you able to just explain to us what the AMP Investment Committee is, where it sits? So the AMP Investment Committee is the precursor to the current Group Investment Committee. So it was a management committee looking at investment decisions. And so is that a committee supported by regulatory governance? Um, yes prior to them coming to report to me. This is the committee that existed, I'm sorry, did you say prior to them coming to report to you? Yes, so the, um, the investment governance team, who now forms part of the regulatory governance team, sat elsewhere in the AMP business before the changes that I spoke about with my change in job title when they came to report to me in April, around sort of mid-year 2017. And then you see in this paper, if you look down at the bottom of the first page, the AMP Investment Committee is being recommended to ask the trustees to resolve to, and then in subparagraph C, endorse the CPI return target changes for the AMP My Super 1990s, AMP My Super 1980s, and AMP My Super Balanced Investment Options. That's correct, yes. And if we go over the page to dot zero five two five, we see at the bottom of the page a paragraph which says a paper presented to the life boards and super boards in June 2015 discussed the investment implications of an extended period of lower returns the challenge for investment offers with CPI plus targets is that the lower rate environment has driven down long-term return expectations 
making it more difficult for fund managers to have a reasonable degree of confidence they will meet their stated return targets? Yes, that's correct. And what's then recommended through the rest of the paper is that the CPI plus return targets be lowered for some of the MySuper products? I believe so, yes, reflecting the low return environment. And this has happened on a number of occasions. That is, on a number of occasions over the last three years, AMP Capital has sought a reduction in the return target for the MySuper products? Yes, that's correct. And is the way that this process works that AMP Capital says to AMP Life, it's going to be less probable that we will achieve the return target that we've previously set, so therefore we want the return target reduced? Yes, so that will be um, <clears throat> my understanding of the process is that AMP Capital does economic modelling to um, look at what the likely um, outlook is for investment returns. And when it's established that you're operating in a low return environment that may continue for some time, they can trade off, um, you know, still trying to aim for that higher target. But in order to do that, they'd have to take on more investment risk on behalf of members. So that's the decision that's being made. Do you want to keep with the current level of risk in the funds, or do you want to reduce the target to something more reasonable? And do you know, is there any reporting back to the board as to how the targets set by AMP Capital for the My Super products issued by the trustees compare with targets set for other My Super products? With competitors' products? Yes. yes, that's a factor that I believe is taken into account. Is there reporting back to the trustee boards, though, about how the particular return targets compare to the return targets for I, other products? I believe it's a matter of discussion. As I attend the group investment committee as an observer and also attend the board meetings, I can recall that exact discussion taking place, but I not sure which forums, probably both. And do you recall whether there was a view as to how the return targets set by AMP compared to its competitors? I'm not sure I understand your question. Do you recall whether AMP was seeking a higher or lower return than that sought by its competitors? I think generally comparable a comparable return. For the level of risk associated with that um, particular option and depending on what that option is aiming to do. Just so we can be clear about what we're talking about, with the life cycle yes. options for different age cohorts, yes. there will be a different balance between growth and defensive assets. There will be, yes. And when you talk about the different risk profile, is that what you're talking about? Yes. So for the life cycle options, and um, I do need to note that I'm not an investment manager, but what they're also taking into account is they're targeting a comfortable outcome in retirement. So it's not sort of a year by year um, performance target in itself. They're looking at managing what they refer to as a glide path um, for those particular age cohorts, so the risk as they go into retirement is managed and it takes into account sequencing risk. So, for example, if you were to get a large dip in investment markets shortly before, you know, in the five years out from retirement, that would have a detrimental impact. So it's not a strict um, comparison that they're doing. They're actually taking other factors into account. And, again, so that we make sure we're understanding each other. Your understanding or recollection is that, for example, for a cohort that might be born 1960 to 1964, the risk appetite and return target for that cohort when they're in one of the AMP My Super products is comparable to that for a product issued by a different fund. It may be broadly comparable, but it may also be taking additional factors into account. 
So it is this managing the sequencing risk as you get closer to retirement. So there's a, a sort of additional level of investment management expertise being applied, if you like. So some funds will just do a, a strict um, change growth and defensive as you go along, but these life cycle funds are actually aiming for a longer term consideration. And your point is that that explains what exactly in relation well, to... It, it may explain differences in targets year by year and it may also explain difference in outcomes. I see. I tender that document, Commissioner. Uh, memorandum to AMP Investment Committee 11 May 15 concerning 2016 Annual Strategic Asset Allocation and Standard Risk Measure Review AMP 6000-0164-0524, Exhibit 5.285. Is there a point in time at which you became aware that the AMP My Super products were at least in some cases not performing well on a net basis compared to competitors? Yes. And when was that? I can't recall exactly. Okay. Was that something that you took up to the board? Yes. And when did you take it up to the board? When I became aware that it was an issue. So we do um, quarterly reporting and are checking how um, investment performance is faring. Um, there was a particular time where the performance looked quite poor. Um, so we sought to take up to the trustee board. I'm thinking it's in 2016, but I'm not exactly sure and I apologize for that. Um, that we had looked at the performance reports and had some concerns over that and there was also a period where there's some negative media coverage so we took some addition asked the investment people to come to the board and give them additional level of information and explain why that was i wonder if what you're thinking of is this can we bring up amp.6000.0128.5191 the number again, Mr Hodge, 6000-0128.5191. So these are the meeting papers for a concurrent meeting of the trustee boards on the 20th of September 2016? Yes, they are. And if we go to page .5549. Is this the paper that you're thinking of? This is the exact paper I'm thinking of, Mr Hodge. And in particular, I think what you're perhaps recalling is we see there's a section which is executive summary and the second paragraph under that heading says the first section of this paper focuses on how my, my super life cycle is performing relative to its objectives the second section reflects on analysis undertaken in response to an article that's been featured in the Financial Review. That's correct, yes. And that article had included performance charts which depicted two of the AMP products as the second and third poorest performing funds for the 2016 financial year. I believe that's correct, yes. And. If we go over the page to dot triple five zero. We see a table which is gross performance and net performance, or two tables. Yes, that's correct. Now, one of the issues 
that the AMP trustee boards have recently grappled with is that for years reporting has been to them on the basis of gross performance before the deduction of fees? Yes, but perhaps with the deduction of investment fees, but not all the fees. That's right. And so these tables seem to reflect that same problem, which is there's gross performance at the top and then net performance, which you can't quite see this because it's, the blow up has blocked out the detail below, but the detail below says net performance equals returns are net of investment fees and platform fees and superannuation tax. Yes, that's correct. And the issue was that the board was receiving reporting on returns net of investment fees and presumably platform fees perhaps, but not net of administration fees? Yeah, so the reporting had been focusing on um, the most variable factor as being the investment performance and to sort of, if you like, compare the performance of the investment manager rather than the overall product. I tender that document, Commissioner. Uh, board papers AMP Super, NM Super, uh, for meeting of 20 September 16, AMP 6000, 01285191, Exhibit 5.286. And then, if we then bring up AMP.6000.0152.0678. Now this is a memorandum from the AMP Investment Regulatory Governance to superannuation retirement and investment platforms. Yes, that's correct. Are either of these entities or groups within the trustee? So the AMP Investment Regulatory Governance is the investment specialist team within my overall team, and it's also addressed to trustee services. So and I'm sorry, say that it's again. It's also addressed to trustee services, so yes. Oh, I see. So it's part of your regulatory governance team sending a report to a number of people, including trustee services. Yes, to increase understanding of particular matter. And if we go to page.0679, We see a heading at the bottom of the page, which is differences in performance measurement. Yes, that's correct. And this, I think, ties into the point you were making before, which is the quarterly investment manager reports include comparisons against a CPI objective and neutral benchmark, and performance is reported on a gross basis before fees and taxes. That's correct, yes. Whereas what's explained in the preceding paragraph is that the APRA reporting methodology focuses on the net member experience by incorporating all fees and taxes that apply. That's correct, yes. And the consequence was that there was some analysis done to attempt to understand how AMP's products compared to other products if you actually took into account fees. Yes, that's right. And if we go to page.0683, you see there's an explanation here about under the My Super Investment Management Agreement what happens in relation to performance based fees. Yes, that's right. And I think what had happened, you may or may not be aware of this, is that there had been a, or there was going to be a change to the fee structure so that there would be less performance-based fees and an increase in the actual fees? Yes, I think so, although I wasn't intimately involved. That was agreed between AMP Life and AMP Capital? Yes. And then if we go over the page to dot... 0684, 
this is showing a ranking as at 30 September 2016 of various AMP My Super products at different life cycle stages compared to competitors? Yes, that's correct. And we see, for example, for the 1940s cohort, of which there are only 29 products that were compared that were on the market, See that at the top of the page? Yes. And a 1940s life cycle product would be something that you would go into if you're born in the 1940s? That's correct, yes. So it's going to be heavily weighted towards defensive assets rather than growth assets? Yes, it would be. And, I'm sorry, did you say it could be? Yes, it would be. And we see out of 29 products, the AMP My Super Capital Stable product ranked 19th out of 29 based on gross return, ranked 26th out of 29 on administrative fees and costs, and then as a result ranked 23rd out of 29 on net return to members? Yes, that's correct. And as we go down, we can see if we just look at the standard products rather than the products for particular employer groups where there will be some discount to the fees, that for the AMP My Super 1950s product, that ranked 49th out of 63 on net returns. Would it be possible to blow that up? Yes. AMP My Super 1950s, 49 out of 63. Yes, that's correct. And on fees, it ranked 59th out of 63. That's correct. And then for the 1960s cohort, out of 34 products, we see AMP My Super 1960s ranked 27th out of 34 on the net outcome and 34, 34. 31 out of 34 on the fees and costs. That's correct, yes. And just to take some other examples, if we go over the page, we can then see the two-year annualised results. Yes, that's correct. And again, for the life cycle products, can I suggest almost invariably the st standard or generic AMP My Super product did not fare well. No. As in, you are agreeing with me it did not fare well? Yes, on the basis of the way that it's been ranked in this table. And this was something that is reported internally on the 3rd of April 2017. What happened as a result of it? One of the key purposes, as I understand, of this piece of analysis was to um, ensure that the investment manager, so AMP Capital, and the product side of the business all had reached a common understanding of the way the calculations were done. Did you, at this point in time... I'm sorry, I attended that document, Commissioner. Uh, memorandum 3, April 17, from AMP Investment... Regulatory governance concerning my super performance measurement, AMP 6000 exhibit 5.287. Did you at some point in time go to the board about what this comparison, once you took into account fees, showed? Um, no, I don't believe I did. And are you able to explain, or I'm sorry, I should ask, did anybody else go to the board as a consequence of this comparison? I don't believe so. This was part of an ongoing piece of work to ensure there was common understanding and to inform future reporting. I see. And then in July of 2017, if we bring up APRA.0004.0001.6657,
Unfortunately, the email addresses have not been redacted on this document, Commissioner, but no doubt you would direct that those email addresses not the, be published. The personal identifying information we commonly re redact and there'll be a non-publication direction about that. Thank you, Commissioner. In any event, I'll... It, this I'll isn't a document that we've seen. It's not AMP, it's an APRA document, Commissioner. That's not to say that it's APRA's fault. It's, it's nobody's fault. But in any event, it hasn't been redacted. I'll see if I can get you a hard copy, Ms. Sansom. Okay. Do you recall the email from APRA? I didn't see it for very long. All right. I think we can put it up with a giant black block over. <laughs> That's very helpful. <laughs> Everything except the main text. Thank you. So there was an email. Now, you were copied to this email? I would expect so, yes. And it's an email from an analyst at APRA explaining that in light of a my super determination of scale assessment that was being dealt with one aspect that was considered were fees compared to peers yes that's correct and the paper it says called out that the generic my super options for super directions and sst were bottom quartile for the second year and that product management were undertaking a review to determine the potential underlying causes? Yes, that's correct. Now, again, this email and this issue that was being raised, was this something that was then brought up to the board? The um, document that it's referring to around my super scale test is a board paper. So annually, the My Super Scale test is taken up to the board and discussed. I see. You're... I think we're not disagreeing with each other. The... Each year, there is an annual My Super Scale assessment that is done for AMP. Yes, that's correct. Presumably for... Well, it is done for all of its My Super products. For all of its My Super products, yes. And that has to be taken up to the board. Yes. And approved by the board? The, uh, yes, the acceptance of the findings of it. Can we take it? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and the point you're making is the paper that is being referred to by APRA in this document is the My Super Scale Assessment? I believe so, yes. I see. And so therefore... And therefore, there wasn't something new to explain no. to the board because APRA was just noting what they'd discovered on reading a paper that had already been provided to the board. Yes, so we would provide those scale assessment papers to APRA after the board has reviewed them. Can we take that document down, Commissioner, and I tender it? Uh, email APRA to AMP concerning AMP Super, my Super Scale Assessment, 3 July 17, APRA 0004 0001 6657, Exhibit 5.288. Should note, Commissioner, there may need to be a non publication direction made with respect to the particular employer that was named in that document. I think I have made NPDs in respect of that particular employer, and there will be one uh, in respect of the employer named in that email. Thank you, Commissioner. And then in 2017 or December 2007, there was another My Super Scale assessment. If we bring up AMP.6000.0128.8032. If we go to the second page of the document so that we can see, I'm sorry, the third page of the document. So this is the board papers for the meeting of the 6th of December 2017? Yes, that's correct. And if we then go through to page 8098.
And this is the what's described as the year four my super scale test. That's correct, yes. Now this is said to come from the head of product management and the senior product portfolio manager corporate superannuation. That's correct, yes. Does your team have any involvement in the preparation of this document? We may assist with the review of it and the, a document focusing specifically on the investment components would have gone to the group investment committee prior to this paper coming to the trustee board. I see. The process by which the My Super Scale assessment occurs is people within other parts of the business product management effectively prepare the My Super Scale assessment. That's the first step. So the, the full sort of process would be from the investment component of it that would be performed by AMP Capital. Um, that would go to the group investment committee with their, for their consideration with a separate paper from product. And then what would happen is a, that paper would be supplemented with further product related lenses, so including the product fees rather than the, just the investment perspective, and brought to the trustee board um, by product, but with attendance at the meeting by the investment specialists. Okay. And we understand it takes three months for AMP to prepare, or some months for AMP to prepare its My Super Scale assessment. Is that right? It does take some time. There's some considerable analysis involved. The exact time period, I wouldn't know, because I just look at it when it comes out. All right. Again, that's something that some other part of the business is principally doing. Yes, but with involvement from my team to sort of sense check the findings. And if we go to page. 8100. We see under fees, if we just blow up that section. We see it's explained AMP's number one market trend position translates to top quartile performance for single strategy fees, but the position is reversed for the life cycle funds. And that's what we were looking at before, that the fees are quite poor for the life cycle products. Yes. And is the reason the, or are you able to explain why the fees are low for the single strategy products? Um, because it's a simpler product offer. It's not taking into account um, in the same way that the life cycle funds are this sort of transition through to your retirement date. If you come in through an employer program, do you go into the life cycle products or into the generic products? It would depend, it would vary. But you get a substantial discount on the fees if you come in through an employer plan? Yes, And depending on the employer and the size of the employer. The bigger the employer, the better the discount that you get. Yes. And it then says in the third point, in isolation, fees for life cycle options would be in concern territory. However, focusing on member outcomes, the most important part of the scale test is investment performance, with AMP performing at the top of the industry for several of the younger cohorts. That's correct, yes. And that, though, is referring, is it, to investment performance before or after the effect of fees? Or you're not sure? I'm not sure in that analysis. I think it's before, but I'm not sure. And is it fair to say that by this time, with the CPI return targets having been decreased for a number of products over a number of years, that AMP Capital was now able to consistently hit most of the return targets? Um, yes, I believe so. Right, I tend to that document, Commissioner. Uh, ASL and NM board papers, 6 December 17, AMP 6000, 0128, 8032, exhibit 5.289. And then once we get to July of 2018. Yes. The board is then coming to consider the question of reducing fees. That's correct, yes. And 
if we bring up AMP.6000.0233.0172. And go over to page.0174. And, <coughs> and we see these are the board papers for a meeting on the 25th of July 2018. That's correct, yes. And then if we go over to page.0180. So we see this is a paper from the senior manager of trustee governance to the directors of the trustee boards. That's correct, yes. And does the senior manager of trustee governance report to you? Yes, she does. And so she has prepared a paper recommending that the board, the trustee boards note a memorandum in relation to the proposed reduction of fees. Yes, so normal practice with the trustee services team is for each proposal that goes to the trustee board for approval, we would separately look at that and form views as to whether that's something they should approve or not. And then there's a... And then was there also, I'll bring you then to the next relevant page, which is dot zero one eight two. This is a paper that is being sent by the Director of Superannuation Retirement and Investments to the board. Yes, that's correct. And this is actually proposing changes to or reductions in the My Super pricing? Indeed it is. And the board is being asked to approve these changes? Yes, it is. But ultimately, is it the case that it will be, need to be approved by some other part of the AMP business before the changes can take effect? Yes. What is the other part of the business that will need to approve it? So the AMP Life Company so actuaries need to look at it and ensure that it doesn't cause any issues for the life company because these are life back policies and the AMP Limited Board. But should there be any concern around that not occurring, I would um, suggest that there may be a call from the trustee chairman to the board of AMP Limited. So it's, it's a case of because of the delegations are in place and the impact that this had on the profitability of the group, um, it is required to go up to the AMP Limited Board because it's a large change, but we certainly weren't expecting them to decline to do that. Just so I make sure I've understood, it's not the board, it's not the board of AMP Life that needs to approve it, it's the board of AMP Limited? Or effectively, is that, no, a, is that the same Something of this size anyway? be both. It's, they might even have the same board, do they, AMP Life? And um, they AMP. meet concurrently. They do have different boards, but they meet concurrently. All right. So they, both of those boards, or at least at their concurrent meeting, they will need to approve the pricing change yes, in order they for would, it to occur. Because of the size of it. And if you then go back a page to dot zero one eight one. We see the explanation, this is still from Ms. Is it Privatera? Privatera. Privatera. Her paper explaining what has prompted this, which is that As APRA wrote to the trustees in October 2017, highlighting that based on their analysis, the Super Directions Fund generic My Super offer had high costs per member, high operating costs and net outflows, high costs per member and net outflows are observed for the SST generic My Super offer. Conversations with APRA in respect of these two offers continued over the latter part of 2017 and throughout 2018. That's correct, yes. And you were involved in those conversations? Yes, I was in additional conversations on this matter. I'm sorry, you were involved? Conversations with APRA and yes. conversations with the product team on this matter. I see you needed to speak to the product team about whether the product team could reduce the costs of the product. I would have been advocating for that occurring. Yes, you were pushing for the cost to go down. That's the case, yes. But ultimately you're dependent upon what the product team will do 
to determine whether there are going to be a change in costs. Yeah, but there, there, I agree, but there are also escalation points available. So if we were not getting to this conclusion, um, we would continue to put the pressure on to reach this conclusion. And is that because by now APRA is showing a lot of attention to what is going on with AMP's pricing? The APRA consideration would be a factor, but it was also my own view. And how long had you held that view for? Um, quite some time. Years? I would certainly have been actively advocating for the change throughout 2017. And do you think it says anything about the position of the trustee within the AMP group that you have been advocating for this change of position since 2017 or throughout 2017 and it is only happening now? It could, but I will certainly continue to do that. I think if it hadn't occurred, that would say more. I tender that, dog. Oh, Commissioner, that's already been tendered. Yes, part of it hasn't. Oh, I'm sorry, it's apparently only been tendered in part. I tender the entire document, Commissioner. We've got 5.290 ASL and NM Super Board Papers, 25 July 18, AMP 6000 Now, one of the other issues that has been raised by APRA in relation to the trustees is the visibility that the trustee has over the advice business. Yes, that's correct. And just before you go into that topic, might I return to the topic we've just yes, been please. discussing about uh, the uh, resetting of uh, fees in respect of my super? There was reference uh, in one of the documents to what was described as the net member experience. Do you recall that reference? Um, yes, I think so. That is to say a reference to uh, what the member uh, would receive by way of return net of all uh, outlays of any kind. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Is the trustee now given any information about the net member experience in respect of uh, any products? Um, we receive information about the net member experience for um, my super products, Commissioner. And for how long has that been uh, provided to uh, the board of the trustee? That's been coming through the my super scale test each year since my super started, with 2017 having been the fourth year. I'm sorry, can you repeat your answer? I'm not quite sure I heard it accurately. So the main um, way that the trustee board receives information on the net member outcome is around the my super options, and that comes through the annual my super scale test. Yes. We are, however, strengthening our reporting in that regard. And it is the fact, is it, that the repricing of my super uh, requires a decision of the holding company board? Yes, due to the size of it. Uh, not just due to the size of it, but because of the impact on the profitability of the group as a whole? That's correct, yes. Yes, Mr Hodge. Thank you, Commissioner. Could we bring up APRA.0004.0001.6606? I'm sorry, actually, I've jumped ahead. What I wanted to bring up was APRA.0004.0001.4047.
This is a letter that you received from APRA, Ms Sansom, Sansom on the 7th of April 2017. Yes, it is. <laughs> and if we go to page 4051. This is where APRA is setting out some of the matters that it has noted during its review of the operation of the trustee. Yes, that's correct. And you see in item four, business monitoring model distribution. Yes. And it's explained in the second paragraph, APRA's observation, which is AMP Super places reliance on AMP advice and AMP life to monitor advisor activities and to manage the associated risks of dis distribution of superannuation products. Yes, A that's correct. AMP Super does not have visibility of the advisors who direct members to invest in their superannuation products or if the strategies for members are appropriate. That's correct, yes. And do you know, or as I understand it, what was proposed was that AMP would make changes in order to address this issue? Yes, that's correct. And have those changes been made? Um, we've made changes in part. But we've got further changes that we would like to make and we'll be implementing. And is it the case that AMP Super now has some visibility over the conduct of advisors? We're getting increased visibility. Um, but one of the things we're looking to take into account is the different perspectives from if you have a financial advisor, they're looking at your whole financial situation one-on-one, -on -one, if you like, while for the superannuation trustees, what we're looking at is cohorts of members in aggregate. So there'll always be a limit to which the trust superannuation trustee perspective can actually add value. But we're certainly um, increasing our interest in the advice component. Is an issue for the trustee the extent to which it is receiving adequate and accurate reporting from the AMP advice or AMP life business about issues that arise with respect to the advisors? Um, yes. So I think sometimes when advice looks at a particular issue, they will be looking at it for, through a purely advice lens, not a necessarily a product lens. So it may be that there, should there have been a, an issue with a particular advisor, um, the impact of that issue may be, have been felt over a number of products, not purely superannuation products, if that makes sense. Can I perhaps deal with a more specific issue to see if we can tease this out? As you know, there was an issue in relation to the bowler pool and the deduction of advisor service fees in respect of members who did not have advisors linked to them anymore? Yes, I'm aware of that. And some of the members within the bowler pool were members who had products issued by one or both of the superannuation trustees? That's correct, yes. And there was at some stage reporting back to the trustee about the fact that a notification of breach had been given to ASIC concerning this? That's correct, yes. But is what happened this, that the trustee was told that the issue was closed in the second quarter of 2017? Yes, I believe that's the case for the administration component of that issue. And when was the trustee first told about the second stage in relation to that issue, which was that the maintaining of the continued deduction of advisor service fees was intentional? It would have heard about that in hearing two of the Royal Commission. So the first time the trustee knew about what its advice business had been deliberately doing was during or after round two of the Royal Commission? Yes, so my understanding is that the matters discussed in the hearing two were the subject to um, confidential investigations and it is my expectation that when those investigations had drawn a conclusion that formal notification of the trustee board would have occurred 
but at the point of hearing block number two, the conclusions had not been finalised. So and while we didn't hear about it before, I've no reason to believe that we wouldn't have been formally informed. At some stage? In, yes, at the appropriate time, I believe. And after round two of the hearings of the Royal Commission, did the trustee board then seek information about what had occurred? Yes, it did. And was it provided with information? Yes, it was. I see. And your expectation is otherwise, but for the public attention, it would have been told, but at some time in the future? I believe so, yes. Right. I've no reason to believe otherwise. I'm sorry, Commissioner, I tender that letter. Letter from APRA to Sanson, uh, 7 April 17, APRA, 0004, 0001, 4047, Exhibit 5.291. <coughs> now, <coughs> relatively recently, that is in June of 2018, there's been a notice of breach given to APRA and also to ASIC <coughs> in relation to AMP flexible within the ART. Yes, I believe so. Can we bring up AMP.6000.0175.1845? This is a letter dated the 26th of June 2018 from AMP to APRA and ASIC. That's correct, yes. And if we go over the page for dot 1846. signed off by Mr. Clark, the Head of Product Management of AMP Superannuation Retirement and Investments. That's correct, yes. Mr. Clark, does he report to you? No, he does not. Do you report to him? No, I do not. Does he report to the board? Um, he regularly attends board meetings and reports to the board, yes, in that way, but he doesn't have a hard line reporting line to the board. And so he seems to be signing the notification of breach which concerns the continued charging of product service fees after a member had ceased employment with an employer? Yes. And he's saying that has arisen from a query received on the 24th of April 2018 from an advisor? Yes, I believe so. This notification, is this something that you had seen before you started preparing to give evidence? Um, yes, I would have done. So the way this would work in practice within the organisation is when there is a problem, it's registered as an incident, um, reviewed by a cross-business incident working group, which is run out of the enterprise risk management function, and then anything that's deemed to be potentially reportable goes to a breach review committee. And either myself or a member of my team um, attend that breach review committee, discuss the matter in hand and then um, are involved in the determination of whether it's a reportable breach or not. So I didn't attend the breach review committee for this particular item. However, um, a member of my team did. And then they would have come back and told you about it? Yes. And when does the board find out about it, if at all? So the board would typically find out about something of this nature through the exception reporting through a mechanism we use called the business monitoring model. And would this trigger an exception? Yes, it would trigger an exception model? because the compensation required exceeds $100,000 in aggregate. And in terms of who is responsible, that is what part of the business is responsible for having caused planned service fees to be deducted from members after they've left employment? Where does responsibility lie for that? Um, I'm not across the detail of how this has occurred, but it may sit in several areas. 
I, but in any event, not with the trustee itself, because the trustee has passed all control over to some other entity. Well, the trustee has outsourced the day-to-day -day operation of its funds and then monitors the activity around that. Attend to that document, Commissioner. AMP superannuation breach report 26 June 18, AMP 6000175 exhibit 5.292. And then can we bring up AMP.6000.0005.8021? <coughs> this is a licensee incident incidents panel document. Is, yes. Do you attend the licensee incidents panel? No, I do not. So the licensees, the advice licensees. Is this a document you've seen before? Um, I've seen it as it was tendered, but I've only glanced through it. I see. In the course of preparing to give evidence, you yes. had the opportunity to look at it? I wouldn't ordinarily have seen it, no. Okay. And you see the incident is corporate super planner servicing fee, my super? Yes. And are you able, based on your observation or, or your opportunity to look at it before you gave evidence, able to tell us whether or not this is the same incident or a different incident from the one that was reported to APRA and ASIC in June? I'm not able to say. I would need to take both documents away and do some research and speak to my colleagues. I see. Attend to this document, Commissioner. Licensee Incidents Panel Agenda 28. Uh, August 17, AMP 6000, treble 05, 8021, exhibit 5.293. Now, you've given evidence, Ms Sansom, in relation to cash performance? Yes, I have. And we've had the opportunity already to hear some evidence from Mr Allett about that. I just wanted to clarify a few things with you. Can we bring up AMP, I'm sorry, can we bring up Ms Sansom's statement, which is AMP.6000.0245.0127? And then if we go to page.0171 of that statement, One of the things that the Commission asked you to do or asked AMP to do was to explain the composition of cash assets. Yes, that's correct. And we were just hoping you could help us to understand a couple of aspects of this. Do you see in subparagraph B to paragraph 165, there's a reference to cash, cash equivalent and other with guarantee? Yes, that's correct. And for AMP cash plus and AMP secure cash, the lowest credit rating of the assets comprising cash is triple B plus? Yes. Do you know what sort of assets that would be then that are being described as cash? Other than the explanations given in the um, witness statement, I wouldn't, sorry. I see, you're relying on information I'm that was provided on... to you by others. Yes, absolutely. And so the limit of the explanation is at the top of the page, cash, cash equivalents and other with guarantee, these investment options will have exposure to cash or cash-like investments and may also hold other fixed interest securities, for example, mortgage-backed securities and corporate debt. That's correct. And so in the case of the cash, cash equivalents and other with guarantee, the lowest credit rating of whatever assets it is that are pooled and described as cash is triple B plus? 
Yes. And for the AMP Capital Wholesale Cash Management Trust, the lowest credit rating of the assets that are pooled and described as cash or cash equivalent is triple B minus. That's correct, yes. And then for cash, cash equivalents and other, this is said to be these investment options will have exposures to cash or cash-like investments and may also hold other fixed interest securities, for example, mortgage-backed securities and corporate debt. And if we go over the page, dot zero one seven two. We, the distinction as we understand it is C is are things that are not cash and don't have a capital guarantee. Is that your understanding? The distinction from B? Um, yes, no guarantee. And in this case, AMP cash, which is in the SST, that has the lowest credit rating of triple B plus? Yes, of one of the components of that. Um, option. And do you know whether any decision has been made by AMP as to whether it will continue to describe as cash things that are not cash? I believe there's analysis and a project underway at the moment to review that. I see. Sorry, to review that. Yes, to actually go through and check around all the options that have been described in a cash like way as to whether that's appropriate or not. And what part of the business is undertaking that analysis, do you know? So there would be um, investment specialists from A&P Capital and they would also be working with the investment specialists in my team. And is this an issue that has been specifically raised with AMP by APRA? I think APRA raised it across the industry, as I, I understand it. With everybody describing things that are not cash as cash? Yes, that's my understanding, that there's a variation across the industry. I'm not, well, we haven't reached any conclusions, as far as I'm aware, as to whether any of these, the way these things have been described is unfair, um, but that's certainly being looked at. How long do you expect the process to take? Um, I'm not sure. I don't think it will take long, though. And I just need to show you a member statement so that you can help us, I hope, to understand a couple of things. Can we bring up AMP.6000.0251.4295? You see, this is a member statement dated the 14th of October 2016. Yes, that's correct. And you'll see again, Commissioner, I should note, there's a redaction over the month and year of birth, but there's not been an MPD in that respect. So I'll indicate the month and year of birth is October 1948. Yes. So this member would be just shy of 70. Mm -hmm. And you see the net investment earnings for this member is $3.23 for the year ending 30 June 2016. That's correct, yes. And if we go to page.4296, we can see this is a member who is invested 100% in cash. That's correct, yes. And if we go back to the first page, which is page.4295, we see there's a, a black bar over somebody under your contacts? Yes. And do you know, is that where the financial advisor and the contact details for the financial advisor is typically named? I, I think it may well be, yes. And then if we go over the page to page .4299, I'm sorry, 4298. We see here an identification of the 
fees and costs. Now, we know the net outcome is that the member does make a very small return of $3.23, which is a net investment rate of return of 0.02%. Yes. Would, under the compensation proposal that has been approved by the trustees, would this member receive any compensation? I believe so, yes, but I'm, I don't want to be too certain about that without having actually specifically analysed that person's situation. Are members being compensated only if they have a negative return or are they being compensated based on some retrospective adjustment of the fees? I think it's going across all cash options and it's going back, um, there's a reduction in the administration fee and then that's being sort of respectively applied back for three years. And then you see under the transaction details that every month this member is having an advisor's service fee deducted from the member's account? Yes, that's correct. And that's part of an automatic process that the trustee will put in place where it will just automatically debit a member's account and pay a fee to the advisor? Where a member and an advisor have entered into an agreement, yes. There's a form that gets filled out that has to be signed by the member and the advisor saying that the member will receive a certain percentage. That's correct, yes. The trustee doesn't monitor the provision of services by the advisor? No, we don't. And is it a matter of concern to the trustee or a matter that has been, as far as you're aware, discussed at the level of the board of the trustee as to why a member paying an advisor to advise them in their best interests would be left 100% invested in cash with AMP, making either no or no meaningful or a negative return on that cash? So without knowing the member's full financial situation, it would be very hard to say whether or not that's appropriate, but I would note that the advisor would be bound by their duties under FOFA. Um, but again, we're only seeing on this statement one component of the member's financial situation. So I don't know what other assets they would have, um, whether they would have other super funds or anything. That's all I'm seeing is that superannuation count and that investment in cash. But even what I'm just struggling with is, do you think that there's, it's possible that there is a rational basis upon which a member would knowingly remain invested in cash with AMP over the last three years? Um, it's possible, but I can't form a view. How could it be possible? Well, if it's part of a diversified portfolio and they're not looking at this particular option to get investment returns, I don't know. But it's cash. You can invest in cash through another superannuation fund. This member is over is almost 70. This member could just invest in cash. I'm just trying to understand what view, if at all, the trustee has formed as to how this could possibly make sense. I haven't formed a view. Is it something that the trustee has thought about? Um, not at this stage, but as I mentioned, we are enhancing our reporting, and I think um, cash is definitely one of those topics that will come up in that enhanced reporting. I tender that document, Commissioner. Member Statement Super Directions for Business Year ended 30 June 16, AMP 6002514295, Exhibit 5.294. Now, there's another issue that has arisen, or of which the board, no, I'm sorry, I withdraw that. There's another issue which the trustee has recently been made aware of in relation to 
a problem with how AMP Capital was charging. That's correct, yes. And you've explained this in your witness statement? That's correct, yes. And this is something that was reported to the trustee first when? I can't actually recall the date, but quite recently. It didn't go through, wait to go through the normal um, quarterly reporting process. It was taken up prior to that. And there are two incidents. One is what's referred to as the AMP capital expense recovery. That's correct, yes. And the other is the AMP capital fee rebate incident. Yes, that's correct. And could you explain to the Commissioner what the AMP capital expense recovery incident is? Um, that relates to a sort of fundamentally a misunderstanding between AMP capital and the custodian in recovering certain fees from particular um, investment options and the recovery of those fees should not have taken place for any of the um, AMP um, policy holders or member investments in those options. It should have only been come out of another area, but instead of being pro rata, it was split up between the two different definitions. It was applied evenly across all. With the consequence that higher fees were charged than were permitted to be charged under the relevant contracts? Yes, that's correct. There were fees charged that should have not been. And what is the estimated value of those fees for the AMP capital expense issue? So um, the current analysis, as I understand it, is um, it works out as a dollar per member, um, but in aggregate it's around three to three and a half million. And then there was a second issue, which was the AMP capital fee rebate incident? Yes, that's correct. And could you explain to the Commissioner the nature of that issue? So with some underlying investments into um, things like property and infrastructure, um, any fees that were charged on the underlying basis should have been rebated back, um, and that did not occur. And what was the value of that error? So on a sort of customer by customer or member by member basis, it's around six to eight dollars per person, but in aggregate, it's over 20 million. Sorry, how much in aggregate? I think it's over 20 million. I could flick to my statement and just get the current number, but um, around 23 million. And the issue is, just to be clear, that instead of rebating back or passing on certain rebates, they were retained by AMP Capital, is that right? Or it may be with the underlying investment manager, I'm not quite sure. But anyway, regardless of that, they should not have been charged to the members. And that was reported by, was it AMP Life over to the trustees in, was it about May of this year? I, that seems about right. So there was a discussion at the Group Investment Committee and the Group Investment Committee requested that um, the trustee be board, board be made aware at the earliest possible convenience. And do you know when AMP Capital had become aware of the, the issue? So my understanding for the expense recovery issue was that they'd initially thought it was um, for a narrower product set and had reported it to ASIC back in the middle of 2017. But their view at the time, I think, was that they hadn't, um, their investigations hadn't shown that it had impacted superannuation members at that point, as I understand it. Oh, I see. And perhaps if we bring up AMP.6000.0015.0170. This might be what you're thinking of, the breach yes, notice to ASIC. Yes, I think so. And this is dated the 3rd of August 2017. Yes. And the point I think you're making is in the middle of the page under background, 
the REs operate a number of registered managed investment schemes, some of which are offered to retail clients on AMP's flexible lifetime investments and generations wrap platforms. Yes, and they're not superannuation products. And then subsequently it was identified that these issues, or that, that this issue extended to superannuation products. That's correct, yes. And also it was identified that there was this fee rebate issue. Yes, that's correct. And do you know when it was first determined by AMP Capital that it extended to the superannuation products? I'm not sure, no. Are you able to explain what the connection is between the discovery of this issue and RG97 coming into effect in October of last year? I believe that some of the analysis that they did to implement RG97 um, demonstrated that this was the case as they were looking at indirect costs. They found that there was some incorrect allocation of indirect costs. Does it follow from what you're saying that the trustee or the trustees do not have any visibility over the indirect costs beyond what they are explicitly told by either AMP Life or AMP Capital? That would be the case, yes. Hence, the only way in which they could find out about these issues was by this information being passed from AMP Capital to AMP Life to the Group Investment Committee and then on to them. Yes, the level of monitoring we do wouldn't pick up something that would impact a member at such a small level. And as it turned out, how long had this issue with AMP Capital's charging of fees been going on? Quite some time, a number of years. How, at the moment, how far back is it thought to extend? Um, I believe it's around about 2014. I see. But I'm remembering rather than knowing. Attend to that document, Commissioner. AMP Capital breach notice to ASIC 3 August 17, AMP 6000 exhibit 5.295. Commissioner, I don't have any further questions. Ms. Sanson, Ms. Sanson uh, just this last matter you've raised or has been raised with you. Uh, do you consider that the trustee is in a position uh, to fulfil uh, its obligations um, in light of the information that uh, underpins that breach notice? Um, broadly, I believe so, but we need to keep working with um, the parties that we work with to strengthen controls and um, apply further checks. So we continually to evolve what we do and we'll continue to do that from this point onwards. And how can you do that with a staff of 15? Um, through the outsourcing arrangements that we have in place, um, the outsource providers are required to um, act in accordance with trustee obligations. No doubt the contract provides that the outsourced, uh, the providers of outsourced information should uh, act properly. Is the trustee in a position where it is able to determine whether the entities to which the functions are outsourced are in truth performing those functions as agreed? Um, to an extent, but it's not a perfect system. To any extent, Ms Sansom, rather than uh, uh, to some extent, is it able to any extent to determine whether the entity to which the task is outsourced, is performing its functions according to contract? Yes, I believe so. How? Um, through the regular reporting it receives and the um, attendance of executives at its meeting and also should anything go wrong, as in the case of these two incidents, um, the AMP entities are required to remediate the members. The information flow is controlled wholly by the entities to which the tasks are outsourced. Is um, that right? Yes, although we receive information from multiple sources, so we do a degree of cross-checking. Yes. Mr Hodge? Nothing from that. Mr Hollow? Um, 
Ms Sansom, in relation to the capital rebate incident yes. that Mr Hodge asked you about, um, do you know what um, effect per member that incident is expected? The rebate. To, the rebate. Um, between 6 to $8 per member. Thank you. Um, there are some questions uh, about the ADA transfers. Yes, that's And you correct. indicated in your answers, although that the planning had occurred uh, prior to your coming into the position that you're currently in. Yes. Um, that you'd read some board papers. I did, yes. Um, and that allowed you to uh, gain some understanding of the matters that were taken into account by the trustees. Yes, that's and correct. And some of the complexities. Yes. Uh, could I have up on the screen AP, AMP 6000 0128-2284. If you could go to 2356, please. Could blow up the top of the page, the, the first two paragraphs. Thank you. Um, you'll see that um, the memorandum, which is prepared in March 2015, um, describes the ADA transitions in the second paragraph and the complexity involved in asset movements and the complexities uh, include but are not limited to, and then there are four bullet points? Yes, that's correct. Is, um, were these the sorts of complexities that you had in mind? Yes, these are. Um, I tender that document. AMP uh, Super and NM Super Board Papers, 24 March 15, AMP 6000-0128-2284, Exhibit 5.296, just while that document is up, Mr Hollow, if I yes. may, uh, does that paper uh, record, to your knowledge, Ms Sansom, uh, anything about uh, the uh, planned schedule coinciding with the financial interests of planners and the financial interests uh, of uh, AMP? Not to my knowledge, no. So the board is told of the difficulties? Is that right? Of the um, difficulties in executing the transitions, yes. Right, and its attention is not drawn uh, to uh, commercial considerations uh, that uh, affect others? It doesn't appear so, no. Yes. Um, we go on, Mr Hollow. Uh, you were asked some questions uh, in connection with an APRA letter about um, whether or not uh, the trustees had implemented increased visibility of the advice business, and you mentioned uh, that some changes had been made. Yes, that's correct. Uh, can you describe what those changes are? So one of the changes is to um, have a greater deal of inquiry and oversight into advice-related incidents and breaches. And one of the mechanisms that we've sought to do is to bring all advice themes, all advice um, related matters together so we can better identify themes. Um, and finally, can I uh, take you back to the two capital uh, related incidents that Mr Hodge asked you uh, about towards the conclusion of yes. his examination? Um, can you describe whether, or could I ask you, is there any remediation planned in relation to those matters by AMP? Yes, so both matters will be fully remediated by AMP. And when do you expect that to start? I think it's starting quite soon. I can't recall the exact date. Thank you, no further questions. Thank you, Mr Hollow. Mr Hodge, is there anything arising out of that? Nothing, thank you. No, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Right, Sanson. Ms. Sanson, be excused.
Yes, you may step down and you're excused further attendance, Ms. Sanson. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Mr. Hodge. Commissioner, that was the last witness for today. So we get an early mark today, today Mr. Today counts as an early mark in round five. <laughs> Nine thirty tomorrow. Thank uh, you, Commissioner. Mr. Hodge. Nine thirty tomorrow.